Good afternoon to each and everyone. Thank you for joining us today to the uh, USD Department of History second webinar. Uh, to formally start uh, the program, uh, let's have first an opening prayer. All together, let us put ourselves in the presence of our Holy Lord, name the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Name the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please uh, stand by and uh, honor our uh, Philippine National Anthem. Okay, so once again, good afternoon po sa inyong lahat. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my uh, dear colleagues, welcome to the second webinar of the UST Department of History. And to start our session, I'm sorry, to start our session, uh, may I call now uh, the chairperson of the Department of History, Dr. Archie B. Presos. Uh, good afternoon, Jeric, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Archie Resos, the chairperson of the UST Department of History. It is my pride and honor to introduce you to the second UST Department of History webinar. The University of Santo Tomas Department of History has conducted its own webinar series since June of this year. The first webinar was presented to you last June 15 with the theme 122 years of Philippine independence with yours truly and Dr. Arlene Carrara as speakers. Our topics dealt with colonial and neo-colonial impositions during the American period and the American and Filipino primary sources of Philippine Revolution, respectively. It is our department's humble contribution to provide you with sequential and meaningful analysis of the past in this free webinar series. Today, July 4, we are commemorating the Philippine Republic Day or otherwise known as Philippine American Friendship Day. Celebrating our 74th anniversary of independence from the United States of America, we will present you with scholarly work of one of the esteemed professors of the department, Dr. Augusto V. De Biana. Thank you for all your unwavering support, and I hope you enjoy this webinar, and may God bless us all. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you very much, Dr. Rezos, for the wonderful message. And uh, sige po. thank you. Po. And uh, today, 
Actually, uh, hindi po ako nag-iisa. I'm not alone. Uh, I have my uh, co-host for today and I will be joined uh, by Miss Irene Boras and uh, Miss Boras will be the moderator for this session. Uh, Asa na ba si Ma'am Boras? Ma'am Boras, andiyan ka na ba? Good afternoon, Sir Jerry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here. Uh, Miss Irene or Miss Boras, a lot of people are actually asking why did the department schedule the webinar on July 4? Can you tell us more about July 4 and its significance in our history? Well, in as much as every year we celebrate and give importance to June 12 being the day when we declared liberty and freedom from the Spaniards and the right to form our government led by the Filipinos. July 4 is also a momentous day for us. First, the Third Republic of the Philippines was inaugurated on July 4, 1946. This is the culmination of our long and peaceful crusade for self-determination and independence, not just for the Americans, but also a culmination of our struggle for freedom during the Spanish colonization in the country. Second, July 4 meant that the Philippines was finally recognized as one of those nations in the global community, which is very important for a young sovereign state. Lastly, July 4 signifies our acceptance also of the challenges that comes with being an independent nation. So I think this is the reason why we are gathered here today because we took that challenge when we said to ourselves on June, July 4 that we are now ready to become uh, an independent and free nation. Thank you. I, I know Dr. Diviana would have a lot of info regarding this uh, topic. Thank you, Sir Derek. Very well said, uh, Ms. Boras. Uh, now it's time for us to introduce our speaker for this session this afternoon. So uh, may I return again to you, Ms. Boras. Can you please introduce our speaker for uh, this afternoon? Our speaker for this afternoon obtained his degrees in Asian Studies, Master of Art in History, Laude, and Doctor of Philosophy in History, Magna Cum Laude, from the University of Santo Tomas, where he presently holds the academic rank of Associate Professor Five. He was the founding chairperson of the Department of History of the University of Santo Tomas, a post he held from the second semester of school year 2009-2010 to July 31, 2019. In 2015, he initiated the foundation of the International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation in Southeast Asia, a consortium consisting of the Philippine Historical Association the Malaysian Historical Society, and the Society of Indonesian Historians. Dr. Diviana is currently a member of the Technical Panel for History and the Commission on Higher Education, where he served on two occasions as acting chairperson. In 2015, he was awarded as Patnugot ng Sining by the city government of Manila in recognition for his contribution to historical writing and research. Dr. Diviana authored several books in Philippine history, among which were La Laan, A Guide for the Study and Understanding the Life and Contributions of Jose Rizal, The Philippine Nationhood and Society, and Pahiwatig, A Guide for Readings in Philippine History. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Associate Sir Augusto Vicente Diviana. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Irene, and uh, thank you very much, Jeric. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank uh, Jeric for uh, allowing me to broadcast from his house. And uh, also, I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, most of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Archie Reffles for supporting uh, uh, and organizing this webinar series. Uh, so uh, to begin with, I would add. As we know, uh, it's been uh, already talked about. Um, 
Today is the 74th anniversary of uh, the Republic Day. And originally, it's also known as uh, the first Independence Day. Uh, this is the Independence Day that is uh, recognized when the Philippines uh, became a republic in 1946. Of course, uh, I like to correct myself. There, uh, this is not the first Independence Day. We have many Independence Days. Um, and in fact, when I used to work in the National Historical Commission, there were several proposals to change Independence Day of the Philippines. Uh, of course, we have uh, August 22, when the June 12 declaration was ratified. And uh, also we have, uh, of course, uh, uh, events like the cry of Pugadlawin should be declared as Independence Day. And uh, there will be uh, the cry of Pamitinan Cave when Bonifacio, uh, I, um, during the month of April 1896, uh, he wrote, uh, uh, Mabuhay ang, uh, uh, I think the exact words would be uh, long live the independence of the Philippines. He wrote that on, uh, on the wall of one of the caves in uh, Pamitinan on a uh, uh, Good Friday of uh, 1896. And of course, we have uh, June 12, uh, which uh, is used as the basis of the present Independence Day of the Philippines. And uh, then we have October 14, 1943, which is the inauguration of the Philippine Republic. Uh, you may call it the um, uh, Japanese-sponsored republic. Uh, some uh, historians who call it puppet republic. Uh, I will explain that later in the course of this uh, lecture. And of course, we have July 4, 1946. Um, and uh, this date remained the Independence Day of the Philippines, or celebrated as in the Independence Day of the Philippines from that date, July 4, 1946. Uh, until 1964, when there was a law passed uh, changing uh, the Independence Day uh, from 19, uh, uh, July 4, 1946 to June 12. Uh, again, I'd like to make another correction. It should not uh, be 1964, it should be 1962. Um, and uh, it was formalized only with the passage of a law um, in 1964. But first, before I continue, uh, I would like to make an acknowledgement first to the research for culture, arts, and the humanities of the University of Tomas because uh, the information and uh, the data for this research has been obtained from a grant, which uh, was granted uh, a few years ago. And uh, this uh, research is uh, still continuing. Okay, so as I said, uh, this day, uh, it's the 74th anniversary of the event when the Philippines regained its independence. Uh, this is a long-awaited event because uh, it is also an emotional uh, day for those who have uh, fought long and hard, like uh, the Katipuneros. They were still very much around uh, at that time. And there are also um, people who worked during the peaceful struggle for independence. Um, now, for the uh, people who uh, struggled for uh, Philippine independence, that includes the Katipuneros and veterans of Philippine Revolution and the Filipino-American War. Um, many of them appeared on uh, that day, July 4, 1946, wearing their original uh, Katipun Katipunan uh, uniforms. At that time, the participants of uh, the revolution were in their uh, late 70s, uh, 70s or late 70s, uh, that would be their age. And of course, uh, the, the then present crop of politician who represented, uh, uh, who worked for independence during the American period, and that include uh, the president of the Philippines, um, Manuel A. Rojas, who became the last president of the Philippine Commonwealth and the uh, first president of the Philippine Republic. And of course, we had many colleagues who uh, worked. And there should be others who should be included in the ceremony. Um, dignitaries like Claro M. Recto, who was the president of the 1934 Constitutional Convention, uh, and uh, 
This convention crafted the 1935 Constitution on which the Philippine Republic uh, of 1946 was uh, based. And there was also C.P. Laurel. Um, although he was president of the Second Philippine Republic, at that time he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, not placed in a very good light because uh, both Recto and uh, Laurel were disgraced as collaborators. And... Uh, both were in jail um, with uh, Laurel uh, languishing in Sagamo prison and Recto was in Iwahig. And uh, the other person who should be in the ceremony should be Manuel Quezon uh, because he was the one who approved the uh, enabling law, the Tidings McDuffie Act, which made possible uh, uh, the coming of the Republic after a passage of... Uh, a trial period, which we now know as the Philippine Commonwealth. Unfortunately, uh, Manuel Quezon died in exile uh, in the United States on August 1, 1944. Um, another person who was there actually was uh, Serios Menya. Um, okay. And uh, there should be, um, as we have been studying Philippine history, the independence should be uh, given in 10 years from 1935 and uh, why uh, july it was because the Phili the u.s government the u.s congress extended the commonwealth by six months because of the second world war okay now uh I, first i would like to uh, make um, a strong point here because uh in uh what we have been taught especially among the elementary and high school students it, said they, it has been said that the U.S. granted Philippine independence. And uh, we would like to stra uh, straighten that out because uh, the proper term should be uh, the recognition of uh, the sovereignty of the Philippines by the United States. Or you may say it in another way, recognize the independence of the Philippines. Uh, and... Um, why did I say this? Because based on the document, which was read by uh, uh, the representative of, uh, of uh, uh, President Harry Truman, the then president of the United States, uh, it, it said that the U.S. was withdrawing its sovereignty over the islands. Uh, and uh, so uh, this word is like uh, withdrawing sovereignty and recognizing independence they may seem insignificant, but Philippine professors stress there's a big uh, difference because uh, um, you can you don't that just grant in independence, you withdraw uh, your authority and allowing that person to whom uh, you, have you formerly had power to have his own uh, will, have his own uh, um, uh, his own way. So that's what happened. Um, it's like emancipation. Um, so you would withdraw your power or authority over that person, in this case, the Republic of the Philippines, and the Republic on its own assume its own sovereignty. Uh, I think the people from the political science would uh, know what I'm saying. Uh, and the Philippine Republic was not the first uh, Philippine government that had international recognition. Uh, we have the 1943 Republic. Uh, which uh, did receive international recognition. And uh, as far as uh, disproving that it was a puppet republic and just recognized by Germany and Japan and its uh, occupied countries, it was also recognized by other countries who were happened to be neutral like Spain and, uh, and uh, other countries. Uh, and uh, far from being a puppet republic, uh, its president, Jose Pilarel, defied Japanese demands to enlist Filipino support to fight the United States and uh, Great Britain. Um, next. However, if you look at the uh, American publications, especially when, uh, when I was young, I had, uh, we had this uh, encyclopedia, uh, which was printed in 1964, and it still recognized July 4 as the Independence Day of the Philippines. And uh, those books, which are printed in 1964 to 1967, still July 4. And uh, 
I might also say that uh, why July July 4? Uh, July 4 was the day when the Philippines actually got its political independence from the United States. Uh, when I was still in the National Historical Commission, that has been uh, decided, that has been argued by uh, scholars in the board. You know, when uh, uh, America itself uh, declared independence on July 4, 1776, uh, they were still in the midst of fighting Great Britain. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the fighting was far from over and the um, uh, American revolutionaries can still be defeated. And uh, it's only in 1780, uh, in time at the state, 1784, when um, uh, the British finally recognized uh, uh, the independence of the United States. Uh, so the same principle applied to the Philippines. As the Philippines uh, bust its freedom, we fly flying alone, uh, the Filipinos uh, are unaware to the fact that the U.S. will continue its influence in various aspects of Philippine life, especially in its government, politics, and economy. Um, and it's also the day then the, that the Filipino leaders literally signed their people to neocolonialism. And uh, you have to define the colonialism. The former colonial power may not be there and uh, supervising physically, but uh, it is uh, um, enforcing its will through uh, uh, the leaders that it uh, favored as new colonialism. And uh, of course, uh, I would like to discuss also the framework of this uh, presentation, which I got from Michel Foucault. Um, According to Foucault, I mean, uh, there are two aspects of power. Uh, we have the first one, the one that is known, or, and that is, done, that is less known. The one that is known is uh, more of a mainstream. Um, so we know what happened on that day, 74 years ago, what happened. Um, so what um, President Roja said, what his guest said, and what happened. And there are also uh, events. Uh, and um, uh, things of power which are less known. For example, what is happening while the other uh, mainstream is happening. The, the first could be known as the official uh, official narrative, and the other is uh, hidden. But when you uncover it, it's actually related to the first. Okay. Then I will go to the sources of my research. And uh, there are plenty of sources, and all of them are primary which are um, American, uh, uh, which are the newspapers, which uh, uh, came for, from uh, that period, like the Amer American, American sources, like the New York uh, Times. And then here in the Philippines, we have the Manila Daily Bulletin, we have the Manila Times, uh, which covered the event, and also we have the official Gazette. And uh, using Foucault, uh, my job here is to present the other developments while the Filipinos experience their first uh, 4th of July uh, in freedom. And these events may seem insignificant or even trivial, but uh, they, can, uh, they have some connect connections to official development. And some of them would be very relevant until today. So what happened during or around the Philippine independence? And which are the ones so which are official, which is official, and the other one at the, the other developments. So we start uh, with the eve of uh, uh, July 4. So even before one week before the time, the guests began arriving to grace, grace the occasion, uh, the inauguration of the Philippines. And for Filipinos, it is a... Um, uh very proud time because uh they could say that they were the first to gain independence through peaceful negotiation the first in uh asia and um of course the other countries gained their independence through revolution this time we gain it through negotiation and uh it's part of decolonization but also see it as part of decolonization 
after um, on a wider scale, after the Philippines got its independence, other neighboring the neighboring countries of the Philippines soon um, became independent. And some tried uh, the parliamentary way in uh, getting their independence, while some uh, had to do the hard way by fighting a revolution. Those who arrived uh, for the Philippine uh, the, um, for the inauguration of the Philippine Republic uh, was uh, General Douglas MacArthur, who was then the command, the supreme commander of Allied forces in the Pacific. He was now uh, was by that time. The, of the supreme commander of the occupying forces in Japan. There's also um, uh, just Congressman Jasper, Jasper Bell, uh, who was the author of the Bell Trade Act. And we have also uh, Senator Millard Tidings, um, uh, who was one of the authors of the Tidings McDuffie Act, uh, who, uh, and, uh, which is... Uh, the Philippine Independence Act. And there are also representatives from uh, the UK, Spain, Poland, China, France, uh, Turkey, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Australia, uh, Thailand, Honduras, Costa Rica, Cuba, and Brazil. So what are the other events? On uh, the same day, uh, July 3, the House of Representatives voted on the executive pact authorizing President Rojas to negotiate on behalf of the Philippines on the terms of the Bell Trade Act, meaning they actually left it to the president. Uh, they left it up to him. Uh, you may say that uh, they practically uh, gave up their uh, prerogative and allowed the president to, to act in their favor. The voting was 57 to 19 uh, in favor. And uh, according to the, to the majority who voted in favor, they placed their faith on the president in, again. And in the sense of justice, fair play, and generosity of the American people in coming to assistance to the Filipino people, quote, unquote. That's uh, uh, what they said. Uh, so they um, actually uh, placed their faith on the United States. And uh, by voting yes, the Philippine Congress authorized President Rojas to sign and execute the terms of the Bell Trade Act on and after July 4. Okay, uh, and but there was opposition. The, uh, there was opposition in the House. Uh, by the way, the House was then uh, Congress was actually in ruins. You can see that uh, picture there. Um, this picture is actually a, the schoolhouse in uh, uh, Sampaloc, Manila, uh, along Lepanto Street, where they held the uh, sessions. Um, so while the Congress uh, remained, uh, also Congress remained in ruins. And um, the opposition um, voted against to block uh, the Belt Trade Act, but it was a losing battle. According to the opponents, uh, I'd like to quote, a destruction of nature's gifts to the Filipino people, which will be handed over to American imperialists and reactionaries. Uh, so, uh, and the congressmen were allowed to explain their votes. Uh, Jose Laurel Sr., uh, related to the former president, he said, uh, I have between two evils, uh, meaning uh, you have no money, uh, you are hungry. Um, or destitute, so he just decided to vote yes, uh, uh, and the other evil will be um, to be under uh, American uh, uh, regulations again. Uh, you have just been uh, fighting for independence, and now you want to go back again. And uh, another one was Damaso Sal Samonte. He said, "I vote yes, and let the devil go to hell." He didn't give any explanation for that. But Jose Topacio Nueno of Manila, uh, a nationalist, said, I vote yes because we are flat, broke, hungry, and destitute. Uh, so uh, it means that the politics of the stomach um, prevailed over the politics of the mind or the politics of principle. So um, yeah, it's as if you're saying uh, uh, you cannot eat freedom. Uh, 
uh, I would not like to say that in the middle of the lecture, but uh, that's what I felt. Uh, now, those who oppose, we have Lorenzo Tebes, a nationalist from Negros Oriental. He said, I will vote no because our country will not die, even, uh, of course, the, there's no American help, nor it will not perish. So uh, another congressman said, and over above my fate to the American people, and I fear of the Filipinos becoming slaves, meaning to the Americans, and said, I therefore vote no. I vote no. And uh, the Bell Trade Act ushered in the new era continued subservience of the Philippines to its or former colonial uh, master. And uh, we can see, see this as the uh, ushering in as the entry of the new colonial era of the Philippines. What is the Bell Trade Act? It would allow the continued entry of U.S. products to the Philippines while Philippine goods, uh, Philippine exports like Coconut oil and sugar will be imposed uh, gradual uh, rising tariffs. Um, this would mean uh, later that the Philippines will be flooded with American goods, and uh, it would also uh, give a, uh, uh, a practi pra uh, practically stunt the growth of Philippine industry because we are just importing all the goods from the United States. Why uh, develop the goods here? And uh, Bell Trade Act would be followed by amendment to the Philippine Constitution, meaning the parity rights, where we would uh, allow the Americans to have equal rights with Filipino citizens in exploiting our natural resources, as well as uh, um, doing business, uh, owning uh, public utilities. And there's also the military base agreement in 1947, which will include the... Uh, at um, Terms like extraterritoriality uh, for the American American uh, troops in the Philippines. Philippine law will not apply uh, if a, a crime happened between uh, um, an American uh, serviceman and a Filipino citizen. And also, we have the Mutual Defense Treaty of 1951. And uh, of course, here the Philippines is obligated to go to the to the defense of the United States. Uh, if the United States gets attacked by a third party. And uh, the United States is also obligated by the same, but it had to get the support of its Congress. So it's lopsided. Uh, you must also uh, understand that the last two, uh, last two uh, agreements, you must also look at it at a point of view of the uh, developing Cold War. That's why we really sided with the United States. Now, still on uh, Ju uh, July 3, Senate bill authorizing the president to organize a Department of Foreign Affairs uh, was signed by uh, President Rojas. And this is the present uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, the one that we have now. And also we have House Bill number uh, 73, granting temporary permits or franchise for anyone wishing to establish radio stations in the country, and these permits are only good for one year and renewable by not more than one year. Again, why am I saying this? Because of the present uh, happenings today, if you read the newspapers and, uh, and about temporary franchises. Uh, so even that is in the power of Congress. Uh, so um, you may understand the, the actions of some congressmen today. Uh, again, uh, they should have been looking to history. Now, following day, July 4, President Harry Truman, in his speech, promised to keep the compact of faith with the Philippines. He was represented by uh, Secretary George, uh, James Bynes, Secretary of State, and uh, he read the president's message. And uh, he said, now the republic faces problems of independent nationhood. Uh, he was not quite very enthusiastic with what he said. He said, these problems will be difficult and trying, and the road to independence is not an easy one. Okay, As I said, uh, his uh, good friend, General MacArthur, President Rojas' good friend, General MacArthur, came here for the occasion, 
and he was then serving as the supreme commander of uh, uh, the Allied forces uh, or American forces practically in in Japan. And uh, you must know also know that it was uh, General MacArthur who accelerated Rojas and prevented him from being tried as a collaborator during World War II. Uh, he said uh, he was he was actually working with us. Yeah. And also flying in was the former Secretary of the U.S. Navy who uh, became the first U.S. Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal. Uh, so um, uh, there's also a story about him when uh, the independence rights were over, when he left the Philippines, his plane almost got lost in the South China Sea due to Indian trouble. Uh, he almost died. He was almost killed in uh, the flight. Uh, in his inaugural speech, um, Rojas compared Philippine independence as climbing as a summit of a high mountain. And uh, as a gist of his uh, speech, he praised the United States for keeping its promise and promised that the, the Filipinos will abide with the agreements and uh, uh, will even uh, uh, work with the United States, even fight with the United States if there's any uh, future conflict. And there are also speeches by um, Senator Tidings, uh, Senator Tidings, sorry, it's a misspelling that he's not a general. General Tidings and Senator, and General, general MacArthur, sorry, General MacArthur. Yeah, so, uh, uh, of course, the vice president was there. Um, he was escorted here by, uh, 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 that was not his wife, that is um, uh, Victoria um, Quirino, his daughter. And there's also a parade. Um, Man, you, the um, uh, event here, uh, it looks festive, but uh, there also so, so look at the surroundings of uh, the um, uh, grandstand, there were destroyed buildings. Destruction was everywhere. Manila was uh, still very much in ruins. And these are some of the souvenir programs uh, of that uh, July 4 uh, event. And it's the commemorative stamp issued by the Bureau of Post for two centavos. While the people are celebrating uh, the country's independence on July 4, uh, the police arrested several individuals because, strangely, these people uh, had their thumbs painted red. That military and police plainclothesmen arrested around 40 individuals at that time. And uh, it was uh, suspected that these were practically probably probable call uh, signs that they are hook, hook balahaps that may try to uh, disrupt the independence ceremonies. On that day, July 4, the Philippine Republic began functioning. And uh, President Ross and former U.S. High Commissioner and now U.S. Ambassador Paul B. McNutt signed the executive agreement of the Belt Trade Act. You know, the day before. Uh, Congress already signed, uh, already gave its consent. Now it's uh, Rojas uh, signing in behalf of the Philippines. And uh, also, uh, President Rojas signed uh, uh, an agreement with the United States allowing the establishment of consular offices um, in the United States. This is also the third document called uh, Establishing the Council of State. And it included uh, former President Sergio Osmeña and former Chief Justice Jose Ayulo. So you can see the picture here. This was, oh, sorry, this was taken before, taken before, uh, 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 before the inauguration. In fact, it was taken in May 1946 when, um, after President Rojas uh, won the presidency, that's President um, Osmeña. Uh, escorting um, uh, Ro uh, then um, uh, apparent president uh, President Rojas down the Malacanang uh, stairs, uh, they would go together in a car uh, to uh, the Luneta Grandstand, and uh, Rojas would be inaugurated as the first president of the new Philippine Republic. While uh, um, in, in short, there would be a transfer of power, and. Uh, Ross alone would go back to Malacanang. Uh, let's say uh, an, uh, an old tradition practiced by 
uh, presidents when they're the uh, um, uh, uh, changing power, uh, they're succeeding each other. Also on July 4, 1946, Commonwealth Act Number no. 570, which was passed uh, on June 7, 1949, became effective. And under this law, Tagalog will be the basis of the national language. Uh, so um, it's a law, actually. It became, oops. Uh, yeah, it didn't change. Okay, so on July 5, the next day, the, gober the Rojas government had its first uh, cabinet shakeup, and Pres Vice President Elpidio Quirino headed the newly established Department of uh, Foreign Affairs. Now, let's us talk about uh, Vice President Quirino. It was Vice President Quirino who initiated the recovery of the Turtle Islands from the British. So, uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, the Turtle Islands were supposed to be part of the Philippines under the uh, 1898 Treaty of Paris, but it was occupied by the British. Uh, and there was an agreement uh, between the United States and the Philippines that when, if, when the Philipp or when or if the Philippines becomes independent, the next government should make a, a, a memorandum or, or an intention, letter of intent, that they're, try, they're going to recover these islands. And, uh, and that happened uh, a few days um, um, after, uh, after the inauguration of Philippine independence. Pre uh, Vice President Quirino, acting as Secretary of Foreign Affairs, also advocated the establishment of a lighthouse in the farthest islands of the south, meaning uh, uh, one of the islands was practically uh, in front of Sandakan Harbor, and uh, the British wanted uh, a lighthouse uh, to be uh, set up in one of the farthest islands. And said, so, you know, uh, uh, since you are benefiting from the port of Sandakan, um, yeah, uh, it's not none of the British business already because uh, it's now part of the Philippines. Um, but the Philippines, for its part, should uh, maintain that lighthouse. But from what I heard, it is uh, now in ruins. Then he began uh, the research on the Sabak lane because not just uh, the Turtle Islands belong to the Philippines, but also North Borneo. And it was President Quirino, or Vice President Quirino, acting as uh, uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, advocated the occupation of the Shingunto Islands. And when I uh, look into what is Shingunto Islands, that's the other name for the uh, islands um, in the Kalayan Island group. Uh, according to him, it was of uh, strategic importance to the country. And even before that time, Filipino fishermen had been already fishing in, in those places. And in fact, an American submarine got stranded in one of those uh, reefs. Um, now uh, part of the Kalayan Island Group. And uh, he sent a young man, Kirino, sent a young man to advocate, uh, to uh, supervise in the, or to head the Philippine negotiating panel on the turnover of the Turtle Island. And this man was a young lawyer. His name was Josdado Makapagal. And he represented the turnover of the Turtle Islands from the British and he raised the Philippine flag in Taganak on uh, October 16, 1947. And uh, uh, before that, uh, the Philippines laid claim on the islands. Uh, so uh, as if uh, the Philippines should would not forget that it, they actually own the islands. And they sent Makapagal as the chief negotiator. And uh, it is because the islands actually fall within the boundary of the Philippines under the 1898 Treaty of Paris, but they remain under British occupation until 1946. Now, also, while the Philippines was celebrating its independence, the Philippines was being racked 
by the Hukbalahap led uh, rebellion. And you know, and there's even some towns where the Hooks were in control, like Kabanatuan, where the Hooks actually made a parade through its main streets. And uh, as I know, there's another town, I think that's in Gimba. Uh, they also uh, held parades there. And uh, in the Kabanatuan parade, they demanded the removal of interior secretary Jose Silueta. The hook said that they're uh, one in the Philippine, with the Philippine Republic or Philippine government in celebrating Philippine independence. Some of them actually declared a ceasefire. By July 6, the um, uh, government, the central government sent more MPs, meaning military police, to pacify the towns in Central Zone. And uh, because uh, the hook balahaps uh, were gaining strength, and the, uh, and the government was asked to disarm the insurgents. In the province of Pampanga, uh, the rebels become so strong that they decided to march and protest in Manila. And fighting in Central Luzon spread to other provinces like Tarlac and uh, Baisia. Of, of course, there's also Bulacan and so also Tayabas. Um, so they are um, well armed and. Uh, um, uh, of course, uh, um, they had a large stack of captured Japanese weapons as well as uh, weapons uh, they got from the Americans. And there's also a report that Russian communists were involved with the hooks. Um, the Philippine Constabulary intercepted signals uh, in Russian language emanating from uh, hook. Uh, uh, held territories. It turned out that there were three Russians uh, whom the Philippine Constabular did not identify who were in the Philippines even before the war and they were lecturing and propagandizing among the peasants. And during the war, they hid in the mountains and uh, after the war, they operated a saw sawmill and we were active in uh, uh, lecturing and uh, spreading propaganda with the hooks. And they also operated a radio station. Uh, and the government announced that there are some um, agencies or uh, associations with links with the hook uh, movement. And military police seized various equipment, including shortwave radios for broadcasting, uh, as well as uh, documents. And they found some documents linking hooks with some organizations like the Committee of Labor Alliances, or the CLA. The Democratic Alliance, you know this was the opposition coalition uh, during the 1946 elections. The Civil Liberties Union, which includes uh, lawyers, like even like, uh, persons like Lorenzo Tanyada, and the Philippine Veterans League, or PBL. The PBL denied it was associated with the hooks. Meanwhile, treason trials continued. For those Filipinos, who um, collaborated with the Japanese during World War II, continued. And the most prominent of those uh, being tried uh, was uh, uh, Aurelio Albero, who was one of the founders of the Makapili. And uh, he was, I think, uh, July 17, he was sentenced to life. Uh, he maintained that he was uh, only a nationalist fighting for independence. And... Uh, even then, that he was sentenced to life because uh, being tried it put him in the same stance, the same uh, uh, pedestal as Bonifacio, Rizal, and other martyrs. But he said that uh, he would uh, appeal his case and he will be vindicated. He even thanked the judge, the court, uh, trying him for their service because he is made as if. Uh, he was like uh, Bonifacio and Rizal who were tried uh, to face public trial. Other people being tried would be Francisco or F.C. de la Rama, who was a buy and sell merchant who became a tycoon during the Japanese occupation because he was selling uh, uh, scrap metal uh, as well as uh, supplying service to the Japanese. Also, we have the occupation uh, governor of Bulacan, Emilio Rustia. And of course, uh, Emilio Ginaldo, because he was active in uh, the propaganda, Japanese propaganda for the Japanese. He even asked the 
uh, soldiers fighting in Bataan Corridor to surrender uh, because the Japanese came as friends and not as enemies. Uh, one of those in favor of the collaborators defended them saying the government had no right, had no business in trying those uh, accused uh, collaborationists because uh, the one they did offense to, like the Philippine Commonwealth, uh, is not anymore there. And the United States doesn't anymore control the Philippines. The Philippines is now a sovereign country. It put the trials into a, uh, a legal question. And uh, what happened is that there was a legal limbo until it was decided with the Supreme Court, which uh, voted that uh, uh, treason trials uh, are a uh, or treason was a continuing offense and that should, should be tried. Uh, trials should continue. Aside from the collaborators, there's also trials for Japanese for war crimes. Around the time of the declaration of uh, Philippine independence was uh, the, tri or the trials of uh, Japanese uh, officers, uh, soldiers, like uh, Tokito Makita and Hisaki Itai, who were both sentenced to death for killing uh, more than 50 civilians in, uh, in Pasay, and uh, also the mistreatment of other prisoners. Uh, when they were executed, they were executed in uh, Montinlupa, and they were buried there. And there's also another officer who, like uh, Fustano Shi, who stood trial for killing 185 non-combatants uh, uh, non in Pasi, Iloilo. And uh, he said that his superiors ordered him to, to kill the, um, uh, his victims, but his uh, superiors denied that they condoned his killing. And also at that time, still some Japanese were still in hiding, and they start, they still continued to emerge from uh, the bush. Like on July 15, 22 Japanese surrendered without a fight in Tayabas. This was the same uh, group that was being chased by the Americans to the mountains, uh, and uh, they knew that uh, uh, the war was over. Some of them uh, were really famished and decided to surrender. Some of them were still uh, in the hills. On the same day, when the Philippines became independent, Britain made the takeover of uh, uh, North Borneo, meaning the two uh, present uh, territories of Sarawak and Sabah. According to the British, there was no official reply from the Philippine government. They, so on, um, it was a, what I call a sly move of the British, um, taking over uh, Sabah. Uh, North Borneo, uh, without satisfying uh, the Philippines. And I, I also made a, a research um, on that and said, internet ah tapos Okay, na? Okay, 
Yeah, I think I was uh, cut off. Uh, um, so um, maybe uh, I think uh, I discuss. Uh, there's still continuing trials of uh, Japanese uh, uh, soldiers in the Philippines, and uh, two officers were sentenced to death, and uh, a third one was uh, being tried. Um, so uh, more uh, Japanese came out of hiding and started to surrender. Oh. Ayan. So again, uh, some Japanese soldiers came out of the, the forest to, uh, to surrender. And as I said, uh, the British made a takeover of North Borneo. Um, I would not say it's a coincidence, or the uh, British certainly had a good timing. They uh, placed the two territories, the ter North Borneo, which is now Sarawak and North Borneo, as part of uh, the colonies of Great Britain. The Sultan of Sulu said that he will question the move, uh, which made North Borneo a British colony. And of course, as a conclusion, now, uh, various events happened in conjunction with Philippine independence. And uh, July 4 uh, would begin what the United States would call the era of special relations. That uh, we are, really have a special uh, uh, thing with the United States. But this relationship is actually lopsided in favor of the Americans. And I would call it. Uh, the era of unequal relationship. And as for the development of this day, as uh, Michel Foucault had said, there are parallel and hidden stories in relation to the main narrative. And uh, these uh, hidden stories add to the main stories. As a postscript, today, July 4, formerly called Philippine American Friendship Day, is no more. It's not anymore celebrated as a holiday. Uh, before 1962, it was. Uh, before 1962, whenever the Philippines, uh, whenever the Philippines celebrating its independence on July 4, the Americans would also be celebrating their own independence in their embassy. And of course, when uh, there's a, a celebration, the diplomatic offices here would... Uh, go to the American embassy instead of Malacanang. Uh, and uh, another thing is that uh, uh, we are always in the shadow of the United States. And uh, with neocolonialism, there was one Russian uh, uh, politician. His name was, uh, I don't remember his first name, Bishinsky, because President uh, Makapagal, who was my professor then, told me about him, and he was very uh, very aggressive and uh, discourteous. And he said, you, you Filipinos, you are puppets of the Americans. And uh, he even called uh, the Philippines as a slave of the United States. Uh, by the way, Bishinsky is also called the little Nikita Khrushchev because they look uh, almost the same uh, with a bald head uh, and, and a fiery temper. And... Uh, uh, when Makapagal uh, heard about that, uh, both of them were, uh, Bishinsky and Makapagal were, were then representing uh, their countries in, uh, at the United Nations. Uh, and Makapagal rose up and said, I would like to take exception, ex exceptions to this uh, Russian delegate who called the Philippines a slave of the United States uh, because uh, we are an independent country. But the Russian uh, uh, shot back said, oh, really? Why is when the U U.S. Is, is voting, the Philippines always votes with the United States? And uh, Makapagal also observed that and uh, said that uh, the American uh, representative or American delegate would, would make some hand signals to the Filipino delegation um, whenever they were about to vote. Uh, and uh, and Makapagal noticed that uh, the Russians uh, know, know about that. And so he approached uh, the American delegate. You know, 
the Philippines and the United States are friends, aren't we? But, and the Americans said, yes. Uh, would you mind if I speak frankly? Yes. And, and that should be, as the Americans said. And uh, Makapaga said, why is it that when you want us to vote, you always make those signals to us, the Filipino delegation? Because it it proves that the, what the Russians are saying is true. And and from that time on, the, the Americans did not do that anymore. And uh, of course, there's an, also another story, this time coming from Claro M. Recto. He said, you know, this, uh, uh, the Russians are telling the Filipinos because uh, the, Filipi the Filipinos would vote on the same um, issues as the Americans. Uh, so they would side with each other. As if, like, the U uh, Ukraine would side with both with the USSR. So that was his analogy. And uh, we are so much in the shadow of the United States. And uh, therefore, uh, also, on a historical ground, um, Makapagal consulted the Philippine Historical Association, uh, then headed by uh, Professor uh, Abelia, I don't remember his first name, um, and uh, asked for what should be the proper Independence Day. And the answer was June 12. Uh, and so uh, in 1962, June 12 became, uh, was celebrated by Malacanang as the uh, first Independence Day. Uh, celebrating June 12. Uh, and it was later officialized with the Republic Act, uh, Republic Act 4116 in 1964, which passed uh, by the Congress, declaring June 12 as Philippine Independence Day and July 4 as Republic Day. Uh, during the time of uh, President Marcos, um, it's also known uh, also as a uh, Republic Day, but when he declared martial law, you know, when he uh, squashed the Republic actually, he just continued celebrating Friendship Day with the United States. And when um, President Aquino came along, Filipino-American Friendship Day or uh, even Republic Day was erased from the list of Philippine uh, holidays. So this day is no more. Uh, but again, there also must also remember the events of this day and uh, uh, what it means for us Filipinos. Um, is it something to be proud of or something to remember? And uh, on another uh, um, uh, another um, on another uh, subject, July 4, uh, 1896, if I remember correctly. It's also the death anniversary of Marcelo H. Del Pilar. And uh, as it is said that uh, he was the real spirit of the Katipunan. The real spirit of the foundation of the Katipunan was Marcelo H. Del Pilar. But I would like to discuss that on a later uh, uh, date or later webinar. Okay, so these are uh, my sources. They're only part of the sources because I had many sources. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope uh, I uh, added the uh, knowledge uh, to those, uh, to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, po, Doc. Uh, we're now uh, moving to our uh, question and answer. Uh, Pero sandali lang po, naghahanap po okay. tayo ng mga questions dito. Okay. Teka, mag-exit din ako. Uh, paano ba mag-exit dito? Okay. Ayan, okay. Okay, okay na. Okay, so ano po, uh, meron tayong mga nakasalang ng question dito. Uh, we have first, I think, ito muna tayo, Miss Irene. We have actually... The first, uh, from, will I go first, Sir Jerry, for Apo. the first question? Can I now state the... Sir Jerry? Yes, Paul. Yes, also, I was about to 
uh, he was about to read also the question of Sir Edwin, yeah. Sir, from Sir Edwin Paul Kabling, a college instructor from the Baliwag Polytechnic College and USDAB History Batch 2017, Doc. Um, his question is, are there any records on the names of the three Russian books? Thank you. Hello, Edwin. Uh, no, no time no here. Uh, what I got was from my research in... Uh, from the Manila Bulletin, Daily Bulletin newspaper. They didn't name those uh, Russians, but I think the intelligence services of uh, AFP would know about it because uh, uh, they've uh, been uh, um, receiving information about the presence of these three foreigners identified to be Russians, and uh, they were uh, supporting the Pukbalhap movement. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the names. Okay. okay po. Thank you, Doc. Oh, by yeah. the way, I'd like to add, uh, I'd like to add, it's also the sign that the Hukbalhap movement had uh, foreign uh, connections uh, and maybe even assistance. Yeah. Okay po. So we have another question uh, here coming from uh, Sir Lee Mark Banaag from USD Department of History. Uh what would you say could be the strongest historical bond between the Philippines and U.S. during the American period that cemented Philippine-U.S. friendship beyond 1946, especially in the present time? Actually, if, if you would ask me, I think it would be the alliance with, uh, of the Philippines and the United States during World War II. You know, it was what you call uh, an alliance uh, that is... Uh, born in blood and it's also sealed in blood uh, so therefore uh, this partnership was so strong and uh, nobody practically op uh, uh, opposed or uh, said negative things about it and uh, and of course the filipinos uh, expected that the americans will continue to aid the philippines uh, especially when it was taking its first step. There was not even a, uh, a, whim a whimper that it is uh, America's war that destroyed the Philippines. Uh, I, I, uh, if you look at the newspapers printed in 1946-47, into the, even into the early 1950s, there was no uh, blame, mention of blame from the Filipinos accusing the Americans that they... Uh, there were uh, distorted countries. What was accentuated was the partnership. And uh, the Filipinos really expected that the uh, Americans will reciprocate. But what happened was uh, uh, a lot of things, uh, bad things happened. First, uh, Filipinos who were born during the Commonwealth were made into aliens by the Americans. So all of a sudden, uh, you are now an alien. Uh, you cannot uh, go to the United States. You cannot be an American. And because uh, only 50 Filipinos are qualified each year to uh, gain U.S. citizenship. And also the Americans renege on its promises on the veterans. Uh, which I was also say, one of the reasons why Makapagal changed the independence of the Philippines from July 4 to June 12. Uh, so um, uh, everything that we said is given as aid or goodwill, there's always something that is given back to the Americans. Uh, um, imagine we practically gave them our natural resources and access to our uh, public utilities. Uh, so they exploited our natural resources. And uh, you know, those um, shortcomings of the Americans uh, started to give, uh, give birth to anti-American sentiment. At that time, it was unfashionable. You might, it, they would say that, um, you say that you, the American, the pe people will say you're ungrateful, wala kang utang na loob, uh, or you're a communist. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you're supporting the Hukbalahap. Uh, so, 
uh, to be nationalist at that time would be not very uh, uh, fashionable. And uh, uh, what else? Um, of course, uh, uh, we are given scraps. And even Germany and Japan, who are the enemies of the United States, were given vast amounts of post-war aid. And Filipinos, as believers of utang na loob, see this as a very bad uh, violation of this uh, Filipino uh, trait, uh, Filipino um, uh, this Filipino belief, this Filipino custom. You know, we fought for you, we bled for you, and this is what he, we got. And uh, even, uh, by the way, my father is a vet, was a veteran. And uh, there was a, uh, it was a bill uh, given to the Filipino veterans. It was only given during the time of President George Bush Jr. <laughs> uh, giving Filipino veterans $9,500 uh, if the veteran is in the Philippines and $16,000 if the veteran is in the United States. One-time payment. And, uh, and after that, it's already uh, quits. So, uh, so that's how uh, the Americans treated the Filipinos. It was quite shabby. And to call it friendship, uh, any Filipino in his right mind would say that is not friendship, that is uh, slavery. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Doc. We have another question here. Hindi naman siya nagsabi na institusyon. From John Paul Abellera, do we still have a strong claim to North Borneo? Is it a claim worth pursuing? Yes. Uh, the North Borneo, or some say a part of North Borneo, was actually part of the Sultanate of Sulu. The Malaysians acknowledged that, and they were still paying uh, session payments yeah. to the heirs of the Sultan. Um, but to claim it as part of the Philippines, that is a tall order. I think we must get the Malaysians to recognize that it was part of the Sultanate, well, um, Sul Sultanate, and uh, uh, and uh, Filipinos should also give, be given preferential treatment, and that is my views. Uh, to the uh, uh, when it comes uh, when you go to uh, Sabah or North Borneo, yeah, that, that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, Miss Irene, we have another question. Yes, from Sir Tristan Osteria from the UST Department of History. Sir Deviana, during this period, have you come across surveys on public opinion on the foreign policies of Rojas, Quirino, Macagal? Actually, at that time, there was no, no, there was no, uh, surveys were not yet uh, vogue at that time, especially during the time of uh, Rojas. But what you have would be uh, qualitative uh, data, or qualitative information on how uh, they view Rojas, how they view uh, Quirino, even up to Magsaysay. Uh, at the time of uh, President Makapagal, there's already a survey. I believe there's also a survey. Um, uh, to even uh, President Garcia, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of a survey. Maybe uh, Professor Calara who done a, uh, a study on President uh, Garcia already done that. Uh, what we have would be qualitative inputs uh, from people on the streets, uh, letters to the editor, and also the, uh, articles from newspaper. Of course, it's hard to trust uh, articles like uh, the ones coming out of, uh, of magazines because you might know that they're probably paid. Uh, pol the uh, politicians probably paid the politicians. Uh, the newspaper meant to write those favorable articles. Um, yeah. So um, uh, I would say that until the time of uh, Rojas, uh, Quirino, and uh, uh, yeah, until the time of Quirino, basically, um, you can be sure that the qualitative uh, remarks are quite balanced. But you know, the time of uh, Magsaysay, from what I see, uh, some pe some people already started hiring PR people 
or spin artists like uh, I don't want to mention names uh, and uh, they are very uh, their ears are still around and uh, and they they pay them as uh, their uh, their uh, their um, uh, pub, uh, public relations uh, uh, men public relations uh, people and they uh, make glowing uh, uh, writings about uh, their patrons maybe it's also why uh, President Quirino was uh, re- was um, uh, was given a bad press. Uh, in fact, President Quirino had done a lot of good things, uh, which we are uh, actually benefiting. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, there's another question here, coming from Kevin Kevin Philip C. Santos. Uh, Kevin Santos currently taking my master's degree in the Lasal, Manila. Was there any attempts by the Americans or Filipino politicians to extend the Commonwealth into the 1950 for reparation? Uh, no. I, being uh, under the... You must also understand the, the party in power, which is the Democratic Party. Um, the Democratic Party was more um, for downsizing and for domestic uh, uh, domestic policies. Um, so keep the... American resources inside the United States rather than um, using it to pay for uh, uh, another uh, territory outside of the United States. And uh, of course, there was already a, a commitment by the Americans to give uh, to to recognize independence of people. Again, I would I would, uh, I would not like to say give independence to the Philippines. No, uh, that should not be the term. Should, as professors. We must be very careful to what we say. We should uh, yeah, the Americans have to recognize our independence. Um, as for uh, extending the Commonwealth, uh, there was none. Um, as a policy, uh, the Americans were already uh, already wanted to uh, what you say dispose of the Philippines, but at the same time, it is still beholden to the United States by several treaties. Um, for example, uh, uh, we have the, uh, the Bell Trade Act, and also the, um, the uh, and later the um, the um, uh, Parity Right uh, Amendment to the Philippine Constitution. So we are actually still uh, being held um, by the hand of America. We are and diplomatically, I have already told you the story with the UN in. Uh, Makapagal was a representative of the UN. The U- US was telling us how to vote and who to vote for. Uh, but mind you, we are already an independent country. And uh, the United States would have it that way. Uh, uh, with, uh, it would be less responsibility on their part uh, and more responsibility on ours. So that's uh, what is happening. Actually, Doc, may follow-up question siya. Oh. Ito oh. po, uh, does Sergio Osmeña has bitterness towards MacArthur since the general himself was involved in Rojas' electoral campaign? Yeah. That is true. Uh, ano, um, Rojas, when he was campaigning for the last uh, presidency of the Philippine Commonwealth, was able to use American uh, transportation American military planes and uh, jeeps uh, that were used by uh, the American forces. Even the, there was also a shipment of uh, paper. Papers was very important because they would be used for printing uh, propaganda posters. And uh, since Rojas was saying that I have this man, the great liberator, behind my back and supporting me, and he had all the resources... So therefore, uh, naturally, if you're the voter during the time and your stomach is uh, boiling, you would vote for Rojas because Rojas had uh, um, uh, this uh, great liberator, the provider of, uh, of goods uh, in his side, in his corner. So therefore, uh, uh, it would be uh, sensible to, to be on his side rather um, Osmania, who had to beg for aid 
from the United States and he had to beg from his next superior. And that superior was the Secretary of the Interior of the United States. Um, uh, I think uh, Secretary Ikes. And uh, Secretary Ikes was telling him what to do. If you don't do what we tell you, we will withhold aid. Uh, well, uh, MacArthur, with his uh, military resources, uh, was able to dole out favors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, po, Doc. Uh, Miss Irene, we have another question here. Yes, from Joseph Salavaria from uh, uh, um, SHS instructor from National University. His question is, what happened further, sir, regarding the early claims of Quirino to the Spratlys, and did the U.S. have any participation in the issue? Yeah, um, uh, so when Quirino became president, uh, right after uh, uh, Rojas uh, died, uh, that was one of his uh, uh, objective. Was number one was to uh, occupy what he called the Shinbunto Islands. And uh, actually, if you're ta talking about the Spratlys, uh, meaning the Spratly Island itself would be far west. There are also nearby uh, islands and shoals west of Palawan, around 120 kilometers west of Palawan. And that would be called uh, part of the Shingunto Islands. Now we could call that uh, the Kalayan Island Group. Filipino fishermen have been fishing there. And he said that uh, these islands are... Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, important to our security. Um, and uh, President Kirino wanted to have a lighthouse installed there. Um, from what I researched, the United States did not support uh, um, Irino. In fact, we are only given uh, patrol boats. We should have been given uh, destroyers or frigates by the United States, but the United States only provided uh, for a, uh, a branch of the Philippine Army. I, and they called PNA, uh, Philippine Naval, uh, I think, Philippine Naval Force. Um, so it was not even a navy, and uh, certainly these small boats cannot be able to sail to the to Spratlys. In the United States practically limited our capabilities, and that's what I would like to say more: is that the militarily, uh, the United States limited our supply of ammunition. I was able to talk to some uh, military historians and said that. Uh, we're given uh, ammunition good only to, to last for three days. And uh, at that time, we don't even have a plan to make our own ammunition. And we have to import all of this from the United States. But the, we, we became so dependent on the United States. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, Mama Irene? From Jose Alberto Jimenez III. Uh, from Centro Escolar Integrated School, Manila, and AB History Batch 2018. What are the Hello, factors that led for... What are the factors that had led for Makapagal to change the day of our Independence Day from July 4 to June 12? Again, Thank you. Oh, oh, again employing Foucault. Meron tayong, ano, meron tayong uh, the main story and also the side story. Uh, by the way, to those who know uh, philosophy of history, uh, philosophy of history would say that we have Mikhail Bakhtin, we have the voices and the silences, silences. But this time, Foucault was saying, wala siyang silences, both are voices. We have the main story. What is the, what's the main story? The main story or the main the, the story that, you, uh, that the government wanted people to believe was that they are correcting history. Ayan, papasok tayo. You might, you, and uh, Makapagal might be accused of historical revisionism. Actually, there's nothing wrong with historical revisionism, especially when you're correcting history, especially when you have the basis. The main story was that uh, 
first, June 12 was the proper day for the declaration of Philippine independence. Why? Because there are formalities involved. First, we have the, uh, the document, which was read by uh, Ambrosio Rensares Bautista, uh, uh, read and written pala. And then you have the playing of the national uh, march, not an anthem, it's a march. Uh, then we have the unfurling of the Philippine flag. And uh, it made, those elements made it complete. So, um, yeah. So, uh, that was done with the help of uh, historians led by uh, Gabriel Fabella. Now, I got his first name. Gabriel Fab uh, uh, Fabella, Dr. Fabella. Um, yeah. Uh, and... Um, that is uh, the main story. The main story was they are correcting uh, the, uh, the uh, historical base of Philippine independence. By the way, Fabella. Fabella ulit. I'm not sure if it's Gabriel. Gabriel Fabella, sorry. Uh, yeah, my bad. And uh, of course, uh, the hidden stories are like this. First, uh, President Macapagal was asking for more benefits for Filipino veterans. And uh, the United States refused. The, uh, president Kennedy at the time, who was president at the time, did not, uh, um, uh, did not agree to uh, what uh, President Macapagal was asking for. Second is that he was asking for a loan, a loan for $200 million dollars. And it was turned down. And uh, you know, out of uh, uh, what you call Samana uh, Loob or bad spite to the Americans, uh, uh, he, uh, he changed that date of independence. Oh, by the way, I also said the other reasons, you know, for practical reasons, because every time we have July 4 as our Independence Day, our Independence Day in Malacanang, nobody would come to our Bindi Honor uh, ceremonies because all of the diplomats are in the American Embassy. Uh, and of course, uh, it's also very important to stay out, out of the shadow of your former colonizer. So, yeah. So, the, historical, uh, the historical reason was the strongest uh, argument. So strong that General Aguinaldo, who was still alive at the time, was so happy that he donated his house to the Philippine government. After the law was passed uh, in 1964, formally making June 12 as the independence of the Philippines, um, the house was turned over to the Philippine government. And it's now the Emilio Aguinaldo's right. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, he died a very happy man, uh, General Aguinaldo. Thank you, Doc. Uh, there's another question here coming from uh, Salvador Erba Ebardone from St. Paul University, Quezon City. Uh, the point question, did President Macapagal encountered strong oppositions, especially on the part of U.S. and U.S. collaborators on his act of changing the date of Philippine independence from July 4 to June 12? Yes, sir. Certainly, he, he did encounter uh, opposition. Remember that I showed you some publications from the United States. Even then, you can, uh, as far as the uh, 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 middle of the 1960s, um, they were publishing um, information that the actual Independence Day of the Philippines should be July 4, not uh, June 12. Because... Uh, their argument was that, you know, the Philippines, um, you cannot um, count the independence of the Philippines from, from 1898 because you became a colony of the United States. You were a commonwealth of the United States and you were occupied by Japan. And it should not be like that. Uh, uh, that would be the argument of the Americans. But... Um, uh, President Macapagal called in some historians from uh, 
actually the the one they sought advice was the Philippine Historical Association. I could uh, say that here because uh, I know of some eyewitnesses who were actually there. For example, uh, the late Dean Gloria Santos, who was the last secretary of uh, Gregorio Saide, uh, would say that uh, he argued for June 12. And he, he had solid historical basis. And they even used American presidents to, to, to settle the argument. As I said, even in 1776, July 4, the Americans were still fighting the British. And it, it's only in 1784 when the Americans were finally free. Now, for the Americans, um, uh, support for Makapagal uh, dwindled. Yeah, um, for that time. And uh, so I might even attribute this why he lost elections to a new candidate in the 1965 elections uh, to uh, Ferdinand I. Marcos. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, sir. There's another question here coming from uh, Sir Marlon Villarin from Department of Political Science, UST. Uh, here's the question. Do you agree or disagree that historically the Americans exploited us more than supported us to become a strong and independent state? Why? I agree, yes. Explo exploitation happened beyond our independence. You know, uh, when we were under an American flag, uh, we have several companies which were uh, involved in extractive industries like mining, even lumber. And uh, there were some people who were against granting independence to the Philippines because there's still a lot of resources to be exploited, like uh, gold and uh, hardwood, Philippine hardwood. If you say Philippine hardwood, uh, very famous in the U.S., it's been um, touted that they were used in uh, uh, interiors of very expensive houses in the U.S. And uh, also the mines here are so rich. Um, we have, uh, let's say, even Judge Hauserman, Benguet uh, Corporation, uh, John Hauserman. Uh, he was an advocate of retaining the Philippines. Number one... The United States should retain the Philippines because the, a lot of American lives and treasure were expended in acquiring this country. Um, but also, there's also another uh, geopolitical reason of giving up the country or the islands. Number one, we, uh, uh, um, because the, it would extend American lines of communication. If there's a possible enemy, they would be... Uh, attack the Philippines, and the United States will be obliged to respond. Okay? So, uh, and uh, another thing is very racist, uh, which I can talk about in a later um, event. You know, one of the reasons why uh, Philippine independence was recognized was uh, because they don't like Filipinos in the United States. They don't like people like us migrating to the U.S. and... Um, and with our uh, rapid uh, increase of population, uh, we would have uh, uh, a Filipino president in the UN in White House in a space of 50 years if the rate of immigration happened. And the Americans would not like that on a, on a racial view. And that's why even when the Philippines became independent, they started deporting some Filipinos, even some war veterans, People who fought for the United States were deported to the Philippines. When the Philippines became independent, they made sure that they still have access to Philippine resources, like mining and also uh, public utilities. That's why you have uh, companies which were still uh, under American management. Um, and also public utilities. I could now name names. For example, Rockwell. James Rockwell, Meralco. Um, so, uh, uh, Meralco is, was American-owned and uh, it's supplying electricity to the Philippines. Another one is General Telephone and Telegraph, which we now know as PLDT. It was American-owned. Yeah, so, um, 
uh, they're earning a lot of uh, money. And um, by the time the party rights expired in 1974, we already lost a lot of our uh, uh, deposits. You know, copper and gold are non-renewable resources. When it's mine, it's gone forever. Ngayon, konti na lang na mimimi na, uh, ano, uh, about forests, lalo na, uh, ubus ng forest. Because if you see photographs uh, mga around American period and uh, after post-war, you have photographs of uh, rail cars filled with uh, lugs, which are, uh, uh, if you link uh, a lot of people, you can uh, see the circumference of the lug. How many people does it take to to hug an entire tree? Uh, we, have, we don't have any more those trees nowadays because they have been cut down by um, uh, lumber companies, many of whom were owned by the Americans. So, very calculated talaga ang, ano, ang uh, uh, parity rights. You know, so, the bell trade. Um, and if you go around Manila, you see some old buildings, you see plaques that were destroyed during the war and said rehabilitated by the Americans, you said rehabilitated by the help of the people of the United States. We actually paid for those. We paid for those through our uh, taxes. And uh, another one, the rehabilitation aid uh, came in exchange for uh, of our parity rights. And uh, by signing away uh, our equal rights uh, to trade, um, and uh, we became a, a biggest one of the biggest markets for American goods uh, in Asia. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, there's another question here, uh, Ma'am Irene. Ah uh, yes, another question from Rafael Gerard de la Cruz. In what degree do the Philippine economy benefited from the Belt Trade Act, sir? Philippine economy, well. When you have an economy, you have an exchange of goods and services. And that's the only benefit that I could see because uh, you can have people uh, being employed in uh, importation of goods as well as selling goods, selling American goods, maybe setting up of businesses. Uh, also, you have a, a good uh, uh, market for American goods. That's the only benefit. But... It, the benefit was more in favor of the United States because, number one, it stunted our own industries. Imagine uh, you have to import your gasoline from the United States because we do not have a refinery. Uh, you have to buy uh, uh, copper from the United States because we only exported the uh, copper concentrates. Um, it stunted industrialization. Um, uh, and worst of all, it created what you call a stateside mentality. Because all of us well, were um, inured to American goods. Um, for example, uh, I can see it in the language. For example, pwede bang i-prejudere niyo mo na, mo na yan? Uh, you're referring to the refrigerator. O kaya... Magkundakan tayo dito. Oo, oh, kundakan tayo. Yeah, so, uh, um, referring to the company Kodak, which supplies sa uh, cameras and films. Um, uh, we have to import our tires to the United States. Imagine, bibili ka ng kotse. Everything from the tires to the batteries in, in an entire car is imported from the US. Uh, at ang... Uh, the, both, the worst part of that is that uh, you have a very bad sense of American uh, or a stateside mentality. So, lahat stateside. Uh, yung, yung, uh, maganda sa patos ko, made in US, yung made in Marikina, pangit kasi stateside eh. Uh, no. uh, at saka maganda ang ano, yung brand. Uh, so, ayan. So, uh, in short, la, lalo na kasama. It made it. Uh, it, it made um, it, it, the benefits. Uh, well, Filipinos, but on the trade side, you can have that trade uh, people uh, uh, engaging in uh, buying American goods. You know, nakikita ko. 
Uh, plus, if you are living, uh, ano, although it's another issue, uh, you're living uh, near an American base, uh, there's also massive uh, uh, trade in uh, black market. You know, some uh, Americans would unscrupulously use their PX uh, privileges to sell it to a Filipino, and the Filipino will buy those U.S. goods. It's ng a ano, ng, uh, state cell mentality. That's why you have places like uh, in Cartimar, uh, known for uh, then known for American-made goods, and also in uh, Nepo market in uh, uh, Pampanga. Uh, so uh, if you're really hooked on American goods, do pa pumunta. Okay? Okay. So there's another question here. Uh, Mama Irene, please. Um, yeah. From Robbie Andrew Manansala, what was deliberate? What was deliberate to Emilio Aguinaldo by the act of the Declaration of Philippine Independence from Arellano University? So uh, you must be referring to the June 12 Declaration. So it again, uh, Aguinaldo was looking for an event to rally the Filipinos to his side, especially now that the Filipinos were uh, winning battles, starting from the Battle of Alaban. And, and then you have the Battle of Bacoor. The towns were uh, one by one falling to the hands of the Americans. Aguinaldo was looking for a uh, event that would rally the Filipinos to his side. And uh, said, uh, why not we declare independence? Uh, and... Um, he had his uh, secretary, uh, the, the Auditor General, Ambrosio Reynsares Bautista, to compose the declaration. And uh, Mabini, who was just hired as his advisor, that they opposed because uh, the declaration would be done not for the right purposes. Uh, because uh, you have to, you can now declare independence when, number one, if you know what the Americans will do to us. We, we, because if you declare independence now, you are now showing what we are, uh, what our intentions are, uh, and, and we don't know what the intentions of the Americans. And number two, it is premature, and uh, that's why you know this Mabini. He opposed his boss on the first day of his job. Uh, actually, he was not afraid of losing his job. Uh, he would say, speak his mind out, but not Ambrosio Reynsares Bautista. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. And uh, at that time, he, the day before, Aguinaldo also called out uh, uh, Julian Felipe, who was a composer. And again, who, uh, there were many drafts of the National March. And uh, he played several versions of that on the piano. And, uh, and, but this is another story. I, I can talk about it uh, for uh, many uh, other webinars. Um, until he came up to uh, an accepted version. Um, and uh, he had the note uh, played by the uh, Bandang Matanda of San Miguel. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the towns of, of, of Cavite. And uh, the declaration happened between 3 and 4 p.m. of June 12, 1898. Uh, so therefore, uh, now, uh, we're talking about deliberate. The, the, it is, uh, yes, it was deliberate, but it was for the wrong purpose. Again, uh, you should have listened to Mabini. And, uh, and Rianzares Bautista, when he wrote the declaration, uh, he was all praises for the Americans. He said that he even said that he, he, he imitated the colors of the American flag, uh, the great North American nation, referring to the U.S. And he said that something that's very disturbing, and which all of us should be aware, that the Philippines is under the protection of the great North American nation. And now. Is that real independence? That is why some people who are opposed to June 12 are saying that. That's why they're saying that it should be some other date like the 
the cry of Pugad Lawin, the cry of Amitinan Cave, or the cry of Balintawak. This would be, should be the real cries of independence. Uh, that's why you have a lot, a lot of people in other dates. But, you know, uh, you, you'll, if you change that date, it will be, again be accused of revisionism. But again, uh, you'll be looking at uh, how to put history and use it on view it from a Filipino perspective. Maybe uh, June 12 uh, has some flaws, okay? Uh, not perfect. And uh, uh, you might look at other dates. And uh, it is a source of academic debate, but not necessarily change the date now because uh, uh, it will create a lot of problems. Okay, po. Thank you, Doc. Uh, there's another question. Uh, this time coming from Ma'am Regina Panlilio from USD Department of History. Uh, on 16 of July 2011, the Supreme Court ruled that the Philippine claim over Saba is retained and may be pursued in the future. Is the Philippine government still interested to pursue the claim? From your end, should we pursue? I think for the sake of ASEAN uh, harmony, they would rather put that in the back burner. Um, uh, Marcos himself said, uh, just for the sake of uh, restoration of uh, um, Philippine-Malaysian relations, he said that he was taking steps to drop the claim. But Marcos was a very skilled politician. He only said he was merely taking steps. Not merely, I'm not, not said that, I'm dropping the claim. No, no, no. Uh, mm -hmm. When President Aquino came to power, Mahathir Muhammad would not like to step uh, on Philippine soil unless the Philippines dropped its claim. Um, President Aquino, Corazon Aquino, um, uh, apparently made uh, a commitment of dropping the claim, but uh, it's quite vague again, quite vague. That's why uh, Mahathir Muhammad was able to come to the Philippines in that ASEAN summit in, uh, I think, in 1987. Um, by the way, Mahathir Muhammad is a very, uh, a very frank politician. And, uh, I will not step to the Philippines if the Philippines did not drop its claim. Um, um, but uh, the Philippine Constitution uh, said, uh, and the Supreme Court, as you said, uh, said that the claim is still on. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it's quite a very problematic issue. As a, as a, uh, you're asking for my, uh, my opinion. Oh no! If you, the, the Philippines is not giving its claim, it's not giving up its claim. But if you're asking for my opinion, I would also say the same. Say the same. Um, but there's this one thing that my old professor, Apolliner Matias, uh, who was a also a historian, a great historian, also told me something. You know. Uh, a lot of people in Saba are actually of Filipino descent. We may be, in a way, recolonizing it. That's why it made the Malaysians very mad. That's, on, that's why they are discriminating against Filipinos. Sometimes there's mass arrest um, of Filipinos, to which we must uh, be active. They must, we must be very active in opposing what the Malaysians are doing to our countrymen in Sabah. Um, because they fear that they may find uh, a man of Filipino descent, which actually happened uh, in, uh, in Sabah, because one of the chief ministers of Sabah, uh, Tun Muhammad Mustafa, was actually uh, born, was actually a Filipino, and he became chief minister there. Uh, and... Uh, they don't want that to be uh, to be repeated now, uh, and they're also trying to erase that uh, Filipinos people or people from the Philippines were instrumental in building up Sabah. Uh, I might also tell you about the story of Datu Tating, uh, Datu Tating or Datu Teteng, if you are in some books, and uh, said that you know this Datu Teteng, he was the first man who led the first anti-colonial uh, fight 
in uh, Borneo. He wiped out the entire garrison of uh, British. And uh, Malaysians do not recognize him just because he happened to come from Mindanao. He was actually a uh, an Iranun uh, with uh, with Tausug blood. Hmm. Hey, Doc. So, uh, I think because we're running out of time, pero gusto ko lang i-flash tong comment ni uh, Ma'am Samala. Uh, from Ma'am Samala from, Emilita Samala from Department of History, UST. The American interest in our forest and mines are so strong that are specifically stipulated in the Tidings McDuffie Law. Doc, what can you that say is, about that? That is true. That is true. Um, because uh, a lot of uh, uh, forest resources, especially Philippine hardwoods, like uh, Nara and Mahogany, uh, they're very much of value in the United States. And uh, the mines uh, are so rich, especially the one in the mountain province. Uh, Benguet Mines, uh, Hauserman was there. And uh, until 1974, it was uh, uh, owned by Americans. You know, the Americans uh, uh, accelerated their mining activities and their lumbering activities uh, after 1946 until 1974. Uh, but that by that time, all of our mines have been have pattered out. It's been ubus na. And uh, our, our forests have been lagged over. That's why at that time, uh, we are already spent. Uh, mine, another thing is that uh, they're also not interested with our mine. They're also interested in our seabed, uh, like uh, the fisheries. They're also interested with that. Uh, that's why um, they're free to explore our fisheries. But the mines especially uh, are of special interest to the Americans. Yeah, so it's uh, well calculated. Okay, so uh, I think that would be all for this afternoon. Uh, Miss Irene, are you still there? <laughs> Ayan po. Yes, thank you to our participants for very for being very active and also thank you Dr. Divya for being yes, patient uh, yeah, and answering but, our questions. But yeah, before we too. said goodbye uh, to our uh, speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Diviana, any uh, any uh, words before we end our program? Yes, I would like to send my heartfelt thanks to those who are tuned in now. And uh, I hope you learned something from the lecture. And uh, of course, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, contact me uh, via my uh, uh, email address, agusodebian at gmail.com. Uh, Can we flash my, it? Uh, yeah, agusodebian at gmail.com or my uh, Facebook account. Um, of, uh, of course, uh, uh, I, again, I would also like uh, to thank the organizers, uh, uh, Sir Jerry, Irene, and Dr. Resos, uh, and all the people in the department who are here. And uh, again, we must also, despite July 4 is not anymore a holiday, uh, we should also think about it, uh, give it some uh, moments of thought. Uh, uh, what we have gained or what we have lost uh, during this period and uh, how it affects us. And then again, we should not dwell with in the past where we are angry at the Americans. Uh, no, 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 that should not be. Uh, they are still our friends. Uh, uh, we, they are still our, our allies. But again, we should uh, see, see them as our partners. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, I hope if uh, they are tuning in, I hope they also see it our way uh, instead of just their way. So we should also continue our research and uh, continue spreading new knowledge. Thank you very much. Okay, so again, thank you very much, Dr. Deviana, for thank giving you. uh, your precious time with us. And uh, Ma'am Irene? Yes, thank you, um, Sir Jeric and Sir August, and to our participants. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. So uh, we have to let go now of Dr. Diviana, but uh, yes. 
Bye bye po doc. Salamat, salamat. Okay. But before we end our program, uh, let us uh, again uh, put ourselves in the presence of our uh, Holy Lord. All together, name the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the yes, beginning, is now. Now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray, pray for, for us. us. And Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please stand by po for the uh, University of Santo Tomas hymn. Again, good afternoon po sa inyong lahat and thank you very much for watching the second webinar of the UST Department of History. Mabuhay po ang kasaysayan, mabuhay po ang lahing Pilipino.